Zipper rolls out to the right, pitches off to Taylor, and Taylor's to the 20. Down to the 15, down to 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Billy Taylor scored a touchdown from 21 yards out. The crowd goes berserk. It was November 22nd, 1969 that they came to Barry, Michigan, all dressed in maize and blue. The words were said, the prayers were read, and everybody cried. But when they closed the coffin, there was someone else inside. Oh, they came to Barry, Michigan, but Michigan wasn't dead. And when the game was over, it was someone else instead. Eleven Michigan Wolverines put on the gloves of gray, and as the organ played the victors, they laid Woody Hayes away. Under center is Wangler at the 45. He goes back. He's looking for a receiver. He throws downfield to fire. Fire! Who's got it better than us? Nobody! Welcome to the Michigan Man Podcast on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew for Wolverine fans from coast to coast. Go Blue, and welcome to our game day edition of the show. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Michigan did their part against Northwestern on Saturday, and we know what's next. With us today to share his thoughts on the Northwestern win, and then look ahead to Saturday, is beat writer Aaron McMahon from M Live. First, my view from Section 17 to get us started. If at any point in the preseason someone would have told you Michigan and Michigan State would be 7-0 when they met, you would have thought they were crazy. But here we are. The last time both teams were ranked in the top 10 when they met was 1964. The game was the third of the season, and it was played in East Lansing. We were number 7, the Spartans number 9, and it was a 17-10 Michigan win. These bitter rivals have never met this late in the season, undefeated, in the top 10, with so much on the line. The hype for this game will drive all of us nuts by midweek, I can guarantee you of that. We'll be ready to uh, tee it up and just get it started. The game is going to be broadcast by Fox Sports, so their big noon pregame crew will be there. And ESPN Game Day will also go live from East Lansing, and I'm not sure that's ever happened before. If you grew up in this state, you know what it's like when these teams meet each year. In my opinion, it is the most intense state rivalry in all of college football. Now, some people will say, no, it's not. Uh, Alabama and Auburn is more intense, but I disagree with that. Roughly 80% of the state of Alabama pulls for the Crimson Tide. Auburn is truly the little brother down there. In our state, it's basically split down the middle. A true backyard brawl between friends and family, and it is intense, and it gets nasty at times. We all know that. I'm not exaggerating when I say the stakes have never been higher in this series. The pressure is on Jim Harbaugh to get above 500 in this rivalry, and the loser of this game will be deflated. I guarantee you of that. Again, there is so much on the line. My guest today says he thinks this will end up being a one-possession game and could easily go down to the wire. I hope not, but I think he might be right. Joining us next is the fine beat writer from MLive, Aaron McMahon, on this week's game day edition of The Michigan Man. So stay with us. Here with us on our game day segment this week is beat writer Aaron McMahon from M Live. 
great to have you back with us, Aaron. Mike, it's good to be back. It's we're seven and zero. Oh, we got a big, uh, big game ahead, so I'm looking forward to uh, to talking about it. It is a week of hype, uh, the kind of which we have not seen in these parts, unless you were uh, alive and remember 1964. <laughs> So we're going back there, but Michigan did their part on Saturday to set up this huge game in East Lansing, and we'll talk about that later. But let's just review Saturday's win over Northwestern. Uh, it was a really shaky first half for the offense, wasn't it? Yeah, they were, you know, it's tricky because they were productive because they were moving the football and they got in the red zone, I think, three times. They just seemed very, like, inefficient. You know, they couldn't punch it in. I think those three red zone trips and that one touchdown – they had to settle for a field goal another one. They had that turnover, that fumble on the, on the catch there by Mike Sand were still. So it was a very sloppy first half, you know, which is very uh, kind of uncharacteristic from this Michigan football team, at least this offense we've seen through, you know, six weeks. They've largely been able to move the football and, and, and get punching in the end zone, which is kind of, you know, the M.O. of the offense and, and why they're playing Cade McNamara. Um, you know, part of it, I, I wonder if it was, you know, Russ coming off the bye week. Um, they just were – you know, look, they looked a little sloppy at times, but they were able to kind of go into halftime, come out and on the other side, and then they looked a lot better. So, yeah, it, you know, rusty to start, um, but they looked more like the team we expect them to be, uh, you know, there in the second half, I thought. Yeah, and in the first half, uh, they were running the football. They were moving the football. I know a lot of the fans, again, were saying, hey, why aren't we throwing? Well, Northwestern's one of the worst run defenses uh, in college football. And we're one of the best running teams, so that's what you're going to do. The running game, again, was very, very good, wasn't it? It was, you know, and that's been a strength of this offense all season long. You know, they, the Michigan coaching staff has done a very good job of, you know, like you mentioned, with Western having one of the worst run defenses in, in the Big Ten in the country, of exploiting opposing defenses and where, they're, and where they're weak, you know. And Michigan considers a run game a strength, and it very much is. So when, when they go up against these teams that, you know, struggle running or, you know, defending the, the run, they're, they're going to do it. And I think they're going to continue to do it. Um, and they leaned on, you know, Blake Corman and Hassan Haskins, as they should have. You know, both of them topped 100 yards rushing once again. They both, you know, the carries were about split. Uh, and they're very productive. You know, this is something we've seen, you know, before, obviously, early in the year. Um, and, and they lean on it. You know, I, I don't blame them. It was, you know, part of the game plan. And I, as I said, you're going to see it, you know, moving forward, too, against some of these other you know, these other Big Ten schools, too. Well, Cade McNamara was a 20 of 27 on Saturday. Did not turn the ball over again, but he missed, you know, maybe one downfield shot. He took four downfield shots. One was a little bit off. The other three, no separation from the receivers. So I thought, all in all, another very solid effort from Cade, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I, I do. Uh, you know, he was, I think, fine. You know, they, they asked him to play a certain way, as we've seen all season long, and he did. Like you said, he was turnover free. They were able to move the football early on. You know, and those red zone struggles weren't necessarily his fault. I mean, the fumble wasn't his fault. Uh, the decision to kick the field goal instead of go for it on the fourth down weren't his fault. Uh, so, you know, I, I think some of the criticism of him, you know, uh, has been, you know, unwarranted. Um, and, and you met, you hit a good point. It's something that folks really are, don't, either don't want to talk about or hear about. But you're right. The receivers have been a – it's been up and down with them all year. I really think that losing Ronnie Bell week one has hurt them. Uh, they, they lost their kind of their primary downfield threat, their guy that could kind of – get those big yards plays, get separation, you know, and it seems like, you know, every game, and it was another case on Saturday, Michigan obviously had to rely on a multitude of receivers, uh, but no one really has stepped up to be that guy just yet. You know, they've they've kind of had to rely on the tight ends quite a bit. Um, You know, Cornelius Johnson, the guy I thought maybe, you know, he would step up and be that number one guy. You know, he had three catches on Saturday, but he had seven targets. So, yeah, Cade was fine. Uh, He, again, did what he was asked. He completed the short and intermediate throws as needed. He did the job. Um, you know, in, uh, you know, I think, I think he's been just fine. A lot of the media has been taking shots at him, no doubt about it. Not so much Michigan media, but others. Uh, I thought it was interesting after the game, Pat Fitzgerald said he thought Cade just doesn't get enough credit for what he's done this year. He said he moves the sticks, he protects the ball well, and he takes what the defense gives him. He said he sees the field, and I agree with Coach. Uh, a large portion of our fan base, though, doesn't give the guy much credit, do they? No, and that's kind of been the case since I've, I mean, I've been on this beat since 2017, and it seems like every year, no matter how successful or unsuccessful Michigan has been, folks clamor for the backup. I mean, I can remember a couple of years ago when I think it was 2018, 2019, when Michigan was playing well with Shea Patterson, and he'd have a bad game, and they'd all want to see Dylan McCaffrey. <laughs> you know, it, I think it's a never-ending cycle. I don't think the fan base will be happy regardless of who's in there. 
Um, but yeah, there is obviously a want to see JJ McCarthy. He obviously adds a, another dimension to Michigan's offense. Um, but when, you know, the old saying goes, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And I think Kate done just everything the, the coaching staff have asked. The, the big point about him not turning the ball over has been key. He's a, he's a, you know, an experienced key, you know, veteran in there. Uh, he's, he's a leader that I think his teammates respect. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, I mean, this team is seven and zero. They're seven and zero. The offense is still moving the football. They're scoring points. They they've scored first in every game this year. Um, they're doing everything right. Uh, so I, at this point, you know, it's it, it's it bewilders me that there's just so much uh, you know criticism of, of Kate. Some of our fans say, well, it's time to get JJ uh, more playing time so that we can throw the ball. But you know what? You know, you get into week eight, that sends a bad sign to the team and, and to everyone else when you decide we're going to change directions. It's it's just not smart. No, and look, if you look at, you know, Jim's pat, you know, his, his uh, trajectory or his history as a, as a coach in the college game, he's he's very reluctant to play two freshman quarterbacks. Now, I, I don't know if that's – I think that's a decision from him. He wants to bring them along slowly. And that's what you're seeing with J.J. I mean, they're, they're playing him in certain situations. They're utilizing his – his legs, uh, you know, in, in read option situations, something Cade, you know, Cade will fully admit, you know, he's not the fastest guy in the world. Um, he doesn't have the mobility that J.J. does. Um, but I think they're complementing each other well. I think the way that, that Jim and, and Josh Gaddis are utilizing both quarterbacks actually is a good thing because when they throw, when they do throw J.J. in there at times, it, it keeps, you know, it keeps the defense honest. They don't know what they're going to get because obviously everyone knows J.J. has an arm, but he could also run. So it's, I think the way they're utilizing is fine. I think they're going to utilize J.J. in that situation. But to anyone who thinks I think a quarterback change is coming or should be coming, you know, I just I don't see it happening anytime soon. No, amen to that. The offensive line did a really nice job opening what were truck holes for the backs, uh, and they protected Cade well, and they were down two starters. Uh, we really need to give the guys up front, I think, more credit. This is turning into a darned good offensive line, isn't it, Aaron? Yeah, I know it was a group I was high on be- to the beginning of the year. You know, they're an experienced bunch. They've been around a little bit long. You know, while they got two fifth and sixth year seniors kind of on that group. Uh, so they, they knew what they were getting. I, I think Michigan realized they had a, a strong offensive line going into this year. It's one of the reasons why they've emphasized the run game so much. Uh, but yeah, they they've handled their business pretty well. Yeah, you mentioned them being down a couple of starters on Saturday. Um, you know, so uh, you know, um, I, Zach Zinter is, is probably expected to come back here. Probably they think this week. Um, they didn't lean on Chuck Filiaga and Carson Barner. By 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 and large, he did fine. Chuck missed uh, that one on the sack. He, he, the, the safety kind of blitz in from the from the perimeter, but they handled themselves well. I mean, and you look at the run game and they're able to rush for almost 300 yards on 50 carries. Uh, and have their way with with Northwestern's defensive line. I, I'd give them a uh, you know a passing grade for sure from Saturday. I think we all continue to be impressed with the play of the defense, Aaron. And you really have to nitpick to find fault with how they played this year. And they just shut Northwestern down, didn't they? Yeah, you know I don't know if many folks realize this, but Michigan's defense is now second in the country in points allowed per game, mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. and their yards allowed per game they're like tenth. So this is kind of what we saw from Don, you know, they're back to where Don Brown's unit had. Don Brown had the unit a couple of years ago. They're just kind of going about it a different way. You know, they're they're not blitzing as much. Uh, they're keeping the ball in front of them. You know, in the passing game, they're not giving up those huge explosive plays that we've become kind of so accustomed to to seeing. You know, they, Northwestern did have the long 75-yard touchdown run. Uh, it was obviously a blown assignment, but other than that. You know, I'd say Mike McDonald and his staff have done a very good job of adapting and and quickly changing things when when things go south. And that's been kind of the M.O. I think all year long. You know, they've kept the ball in front of them, as I I said. They've You know, that bend, don't don't break mentality where, you know, they don't give up those huge plays and they're limiting teams to field goals instead of touchdowns or forced, in the case Saturday, obviously forced a couple more turnovers, which has certainly increased the last couple weeks. You know, I can remember the first – three or four games this year where we were all wondering, well, where were the interceptions? Well, the turnovers are now starting to come. Uh, you've got Eden Hutchinson obviously playing well. David Ajabo is a guy who I think is, in a way, flown to the radar. and He's kind of had, you know, I think in the running, I, I think should be for, for most improved player on this team. I mean, he's looked fantastic this year. So I think with the way the different alignments, disguises, and the way they're playing, uh, this defense is certainly uh, is certainly the strength, I think, of this Michigan team at this point. Right, and I would throw special teams in there, too. They deserve some applause. We don't talk about them that much, but the punt and the kick coverage uh, has been very good. It was Saturday. Robbins was booming punts, and Moody continues to be money on field goals and extra points. I mean, he did miss one on Saturday, 
but he's 14 of 16 this year. You really can't ask much more from your special teams, can you, Aaron? No, credit Jay Harbaugh. I mean, he's been around this program a few years now. He's obviously still coaching tight ends, but I think he's put more emphasis on the special teams this year. Uh, and he's got an experienced group. I mean, you mentioned Moody. He's been around for a few years. He's alternating kicks last year with with uh, Quinn Nordine. Robbins has been around a while. So I think it's, it's a veteran experienced group. They're playing confidently. And it's it certainly, um, you know, brought value to this Michigan team where, it, you know, it, it's given them opportunities, uh, to, you know, switch the field position and give them extra uh, possession. So, yeah, the special teams are credit. It was something Jim Harbaugh praised after the game. He really liked really liked their play and that obviously that punt block from Cornelius Johnson who they kind of threw in their last minute uh but yeah they're, they're playing really well on, on that group well this Saturday's game not only has the usual attention of everyone in this state but the eyes of the nation will be watching too it is the biggest game in college football this week the atmosphere in East Lansing will be absolutely loony won't it Aaron yeah, I'm expecting it to be. You know, <laughs> social media's already go, been ablaze in the last few days. Uh, you know, the rivalry is certainly there. You know, when both teams are seven and zero, ranked in the top ten, I can't think of much more, you know, a, a, any more gravatis than this. I mean, it's going to be kind of, you know, obviously the, the fans are going to be ready. They're going to be rowdy. Um, they're they're uh, both sides are going to be energized. Bragging rights are obviously on the line, but there's so much more than that. I mean, as I mentioned, both teams are unbeaten at seven and zero. You know, Big Ten title, you know, hopes, you know, hinge, obviously. Both these teams are kind of in the running, obviously, for the college football playoff, and a win will certainly propel the uh, the, the winner. Well, Mel Tucker has done a really great job of piecing together this team. I think he has 15 uh, portal players on the roster, most of them contributing, and they have been surprisingly good on both sides of the ball. Um, the offense, it's balanced and it's dangerous. This will be another big test for the Michigan defense, won't it, Aaron? Yeah, and I don't think you could talk about that group without talking about Kenneth Walker, their running back. I mean, right. he, he, you know, we've seen what you know Blake Corman and Son Haskins have done. I mean, Kenneth Walker's been even better. You know, he's been fantastic, and he's been probably the biggest surprise of the Big Ten so far this year. They've leaned on him a ton. I suspect they'll do the same thing on Saturday. So it's going to be a big test for Michigan's defensive line. Uh, I think they've held up relatively well against the run this year, uh, but this certainly is going to be their biggest test. So I, I, I'm really curious to see how they, they deal with it. Uh, but, yeah, you mentioned the transfers, and, and that's something Mel Tucker's leaned on quite a bit this year. He brought in a bunch, especially on the defensive side of the ball. A lot of linebackers, a lot of secondary guys. Um, he's, he's made the most out of the transfer portal, and he has shown that you know you can you can win with those plug and play plug and play guys. Uh, Michigan State has been a you know success story in the Big Ten, probably more so than Michigan this year, just based on where they were and having you know Tucker's first year last year. So you know kudos to them. Uh, you know I, I think these are two relatively even matched teams, just in terms of their strengths and, and weaknesses and the like. So I'm, I'm Saturday is going to be a fascinating game. I think it's going to tell us a lot about you know if we're talking about Michigan you know, a lot about this Michigan team and, and how good it, it really is, you know, because if you look at their, you know, the first seven games of their schedule, you know, the combined records of their opponents is about 500. Uh, next five games are, are, I think I counted 24 and 11, uh, the combined record for the next five opponents. So Michigan's going to learn a lot about themselves Saturday. I think we're going to find out if they're a legitimate Big Ten title contender or maybe they're just a, you know, the best of, of the rest of the Big Ten. Of the first seven games, we really have not seen a team, the defense, I should say, has not seen a team that really is balanced and very good throwing the ball and running the football. We're going to see that Saturday. And, you know, that secondary, the Michigan secondary, it's it's been better than I expected, of course. Uh, they're playing a lot less man this year, so Mike McDonald is protecting them, uh, trying to shore up some of the weaknesses. But they're going to be tested on Saturday. I think this group of Spartan receivers could be the biggest challenge yet for that secondary, Aaron. It will be, yeah. And Peyton Thorne, the quarterback, has been playing fantastic this year. He's another guy kind of like Cade who hasn't made a ton of mistakes and been able to find this guy, you know, find make the right play. Michigan State is loaded offensively. they got some good receivers. Quarterback's playing well. Uh I, I'm really curious to see how the secondary handles it. I mentioned the run game, and, and they're going to obviously probably have to step, you know fill the box a little bit there. So it's going to, I think it's going to create some inopportune you know opportunity you know, situations for Michigan's Michigan secondary. So how Jamon Green, DJ Turner, and Vince Gray play, um, you know, will be I think important. You know, we saw DJ Turner, you know, an extended time on Saturday at the interception. So the, the Michigan's clearly trying to get him more reps and more playing time uh, in, pro- in preparation for the, you know the stretch here. Um, but, yeah, Michigan State's going to probably put up some points. They're going to at least try to throw the ball. Uh, it, it's going to be a, a fascinating test for Michigan's defense. Because, as you mentioned, they've had some 
you know, some some tests here and there. I thought Adrian Martinez was a, was a, was a good um, example of that. Um, but you know, balanced as you mentioned, ba- balanced offenses haven't haven't been haven't been a consistent threat for Michigan this year. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how they fare on Saturday. Yeah, absolutely. And over on the other side of the ball, the, uh, the Spartan D has been really good in the trenches. Very solid. Their linebacking core, especially Halliday, has been uh, very surprising. But their secondary has been shredded on occasion this year. So I'm sure Gaddis wants to uh, establish the run. It's what Michigan does best. So you want to do that. But we're going to have to throw the ball a little more effectively this week, aren't we? Yeah, and I think this is going to be an opportunity for, you know, Kay Mack, and we talked about him earlier in the conversation. And, you know, I, I think this is a real opportunity for him to show out and show that you know, he can be that, that quarterback that the Michigan fan base can rally around. You know, he's he's had some good games. Like, as we talked about, he's been turnover free. But this is a real, real chance for him uh, to show that, you know, he can be that gamer. And, and look, he hasn't really had that played in that big opportune rivalry game just yet i mean remember he's only had eight starts through his college career uh, they're seven and oh but the competition so far at least you know the big 10 hasn't been hasn't been great you know so this is an opportunity for him to go on the road in a hostile environment at spartan stadium and and get a win you know i, I can remember talking to shea patterson on his way out at michigan and to this day some of his fondest michigan moments we're, we're going into Spartan Stadium and beating Michigan State. So I, I think this is an opportunity for, for Kay to, to be able to, you know, say the same thing. Uh, not only get Michigan to win, but show that, you know, he can he can lead this team to a, to a big-time victory. Well, the Spartans are coming off bye week, and something tells me uh, they're going to have some wrinkles to throw at Michigan, Aaron, on both sides of the ball. I'm sure Michigan is going to expect that, though, aren't they? Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious how Michigan State comes out Saturday, especially in the first half. You know, we saw the first half from Michigan against Northwestern coming off the bye, and they're a little rusty, as we talked about. And I, I wonder if that's going to be the case for, for Michigan State on Saturday. If so, that's an opportun- opportunity, obviously, for Michigan to jump on them and, and score early and get ahead early, which I think is going to be important, especially – you know, especially on, on the road. So we'll see, um, you know, they, they will, they have had an extra week to prepare for Michigan, which I think is, it certainly should help the Spartans. Uh, but I think you can only watch so much tape and do so much preparation before you, you actually, you know, suit up and play the game. You know, emo- emotions are going to be high, especially early on. It seems like every game, whether it's in East Lansing, Ann Arbor, you hear a lot of you know, back and forth and, and everything else. So that those first you know, 30 minutes in the first two quarters are going to be key, I think, for, for Michigan. They need to get a lead early uh, and, and give them an opportunity to go in that second half ahead. And I think that's, the, you know, best case for uh, – best path for, for a win on Saturday. Well, the last time Michigan and Michigan State met as top ten opponents was in the third week of the season in 1964 in East Lansing. This is the first time they've met 7-0 and going into uh, the game. Uh, at that time, uh, Michigan was number seven. Michigan State was number nine. And Michigan won 17 to 10. So the hype, both locally and nationally, should be off the charts by noon on Saturday. Yeah, I think it's really shaped up to be probably the best game of the weekend. I know there's a, this assumption that maybe Ohio State, Penn State would be the kind of the college football playoff elimination game. Well, Penn State's coming off that loss to Illinois on Saturday. They've already got two losses, so they're pretty much out of it. You know, ESP and ABC ended up picking up that game and putting it in prime time, where Fox, you know, had had the Michigan. Michigan State game for noon on Saturday, but that's, I mean, all eyes are going to be on that game. It's going to be the, you know, the, the I think the only top 10 matchup of the weekend. Uh, it's got, as I mentioned, it's got huge, you know, um, you know, potential for the big 10 title race and potential playoff. Um, so it's, it's going to be a huge matchup. It's, it's going to, I think the winner is going to come out on the other side uh, with a real chance uh, to make a run here and, and the other, and, and I'm not going to, and I'm, I won't say that the loser won't have a chance here, but, just from a from a you know a, a emotional standpoint, this game is so high and so rabid that you know it, it can really uh, it can really change the trajectory of your season. So I'm really curious to see how Saturday uh, plays out, how Michigan looks, how they start you know early, uh, and how Kate McNamara plays. Final question for you, Aaron, before we let you get away. Sparty will have the advantage of playing in front of their uh, crazy home crowd, and that's always worth points. It counts for a lot. Do you see this game, though? We talked about this a few minutes ago, how evenly matched these teams are. Do you see this as one that could go right down to the wire? I, I do. It seems like every year when they play this game, it's it's always pretty close going into you know late stages. I mean, last year even you know Michigan lost. It was a close game. It, last time East Lansing was another close game. They went you know went to the fourth quarter. I certainly think it's going to be a one possession game either way. You know, I haven't had to make a prediction yet. I'm still thinking about it. 
Um, I, you know, the, Michigan State obviously gets a slight edge because it's at home. Um, but as we've seen, Michigan's won the last two in East Lansing, so they have, they've had no issue going in there and, and stealing a victory or getting a win. Um, you know, odds makers uh, released the lines on, on Sunday and opened as Mi- Michigan opened as a, as a slight four point favorite. It's dropped down a little bit to three and a half. I suspect it's probably going to close around three, which signals to me the odds makers look at you know Michigan as about a touchdown favorite on a neutral field. Um, so that, that I think that folks think Michigan is the better team statistically. They probably look like they're slightly the better team. Um, but again, this game's in East Lansing. You know, home environments do matter, especially in college football. Uh, so we will see. I think it's going to be a close one. I think it should be a fun one, uh, and it probably will go down the wire, yeah. You hear uh, fans say year after year in a rivalry game, you can, especially Michigan-Michigan State, that you can throw out the records. It doesn't matter. Uh, hard to do that this year. It's, uh, it's probably never mattered more since 1964. It is going to be interesting, so we will um, we'll see on Saturday. Here with us on our Michigan Game Day segment this week has been beat writer Aaron McMahon from Am Live. Aaron, always a pleasure to uh, have you on the show with us. Thank you for being so gracious with your time, and we look forward to that next visit. No problem, Mike. Enjoy the game, everyone. On Quick Hits today, Jim didn't have much to say about injuries at his Monday presser. He hopes to have Zinter and Keegan back, and Roman Wilson should be good to go. He did see some action on Saturday against Northwestern. We'll just have to wait until Saturday to see if any of them are game-time decisions. Also at his presser on Monday, Jim was as intense as I've seen him since his first year on the job. He said Michigan State is playing good ball, and Michigan has to approach this game with an elimination mentality. I think it's safe to say both teams will be ready to rock at noon on Saturday. On this Thursday's Visitor's Edition, my guest will be Graham Couch from the Lansing State Journal. He'll share his thoughts on this huge game and get us updated on things from a Spartan perspective. So make sure you join us. That will do it for now. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Have a great Wolverine week, everyone. Until Thursday, take care, and as always, go blue. Thanks for joining us today on The Michigan Man, here on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network, and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Our listener lines are open 24-7 for your calls at 313-263-4842. That's 313-263-4842. Or email us at the Michigan Man Podcast at Yahoo.com. That's the Michigan Man Podcast at Yahoo.com. The Michigan Man Podcast is produced at the studios of Robin Lynn Productions, Allen Park, Michigan, and is not affiliated with the University of Michigan. Go blue.